Okay. On this episode of What Cameron Did Wrong at Live at Epifan, <laughs> <laughs> so everyone watching on Facebook just got a little bit of a sneak peek, uh, but uh, apparently uh, YouTube wasn't running yet. No, so sorry guys. I'll have to go back over everything. All the awesome information I just said that I totally don't remember. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are on episode 96. I know that now. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yes, Cameron mentioned it earlier. <laughs> Um, obviously, we have a few things we're going to cover today. Uh, today's show, we're obviously going to be looking over how to set up high-quality webinar streaming. Yeah. Um, if you guys were part of the webinar earlier this week, you guys got to see me utilize a little bit of the information with some of our new features for Perl Mini, Perl 2, I guess the Perl family, really, in integration yeah. with Kaltura. Yeah, which is a super interesting uh, feature for that product line. And so we did that webinar with, with Matt hosting. Yeah. And we wanted to share with you this week lessons learned. We've done a number of these webinars now. Yep. Um, we wanted to share how we do them, uh, lessons learned, why you might want to do them, why you might want to choose specific gear uh, to do it in specific ways that might suit your audience the best. Uh, so we'll share our side of it and hopefully that will help you. But before we do that, um, do a little bit of roll call here in the chat. I can see Craig Randall's in there. Uh, Tom Barnacle, uh, I'll see you in a couple weeks, Tom. Uh, a few other people in there, Bill, uh, Sassy Photo, is that the name? Um, people throwing in some questions in there, Ghost uh, JV Productions in there. So it's nice to see you all. Um, so please throw in chat, uh, any chat you feel like, but also questions as we go through everything, and uh, we'll try and address those. Uh, but first, the news. Ah, uh, yes. I'm pretty sure say. we have uh, some sort of contest, do we not? We do have a contest. Actually, Stefan was in the chat as well mentioning the contest. Yes, uh, so we do have that contest running. For those of you who don't know, we are running a giveaway uh, where you can enter a contest. There's a contest entry form on our website at epifan.com. There's a big giant banner you cannot miss. Pretty much the first uh, thing you'll see. But we want to see your video uh, chops. We want to see your skills. We want to see what you got. And... Uh, in return, we are giving away a trip to either NAB in Las Vegas in April. Or IS, IB, IBC. IB, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sick, corrected. IBC in Amsterdam. Yes, later in the year in September. Um, so check out the details there. Throw together a video. It doesn't have to be long. And uh, we're going to be going through those. I don't have one to share this week, unfortunately. Uh, we do have a number of entries, but there wasn't one that we really loved this week, so we're not sharing it. Um, but we want to see yours. Make it cool. Make it interesting. Make us laugh, especially. That's always good. Yep. And uh, you could win a very cool trip to hang out with some of us, some of the Epifan team, probably have um, at one of these shows, and maybe even make a guest appearance on uh, on one of our live shows at some point. So, yeah. enter please. Link in the chat, um, and we'll uh, we'll get those in there. Now, speaking about uh, Amsterdam, though, we do have ISE coming up yes. in a couple of weeks. The other eye show. Yeah, yeah the, uh, the other eye <laughs> show that I mistaken that for. Yeah. for uh, coming up in February. Um, so ISE, we are going to be there again. I believe mm -hmm. we're. Uh, Area or bo booth? Uh, I honestly don't. I remember. think we're like a, hall we're, eleven or something. Yeah, we're hall eleven <laughs> booth one one zero. I down believe. the side of the wall there, you know. Um, we're a pretty great location. Up the escalators, a little bit down the end. It's here. pretty easy. Go. Pretty yeah. easy. Uh, but if anyone's planning on attending ISE, we would love to see you there. Stop by the booth, say hi. Uh, I will be there. Other George will be there, and yep. then uh, of course other Epic fan staff will be there. We will have all of our products, and we'd be happy to talk to you about uh, what you might want to know, learn, or uh, play around with those those things at the booth, and uh, so that one, that's always an interesting show. It's a, it's a tough one, because it's a long way to go. It's always February fun times, but. It's, uh, it's massive. Uh, I went for the first time last year, I guess, yeah, 2018, obviously that's last year now, um, where I got to actually walk most of the halls, and just to go from yeah. one end to the other takes, what, it's 15, big, 20 it's minutes easily? It's and a, a and it's even bigger this year, so. Yeah, it's still IBC though. The one we're giving away a trip to is bigger, so. Well, you know, Watch some it. of us haven't gone to IBC yet. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's different. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna try and quickly address some of the chat questions here, and then we're gonna dive into our topic. So some of the chat stuff was a little off topic for this week, so I wanted to just hit those real quick for you guys. Fair. Uh, so let's see. Uh, Ghost uh, JV prediction. It's been a while since you've been here. Well, welcome back. Um, Richard Bailey, uh, also saying hi. Hi, Richard. I'll see you uh, and Tom in a couple weeks. Um, and uh, let's see. Sassy Photo was saying, uh, is there a way for the webcaster to uh, a given RTMP, like a custom RTMP stream? No. Webcaster only integrates with APIs from Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and some of the newer partnerships 
um, like Switchboard, yeah. um, Streaming Church, and some of the others we've added, it does not have the ability to do a custom RTMP stream. Your follow-up question to that was, you'd like to know if we did have a product that does custom RTMP, and yes, we absolutely do. Uh, our Pearl line of products, the Pearl Mini and Pearl 2, uh, can do custom RTMP absolutely. to basically any platform you want. And that's a great segue, actually, because Pearl is uh, a big focus of our webinar sheet of things yes. to discuss on today's show. Uh, because You're not going to organize that sheet of paper yeah, again? Organize like that one sheet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not only is the Pearl 2 the anchor and cornerstone of this show for our running our live streams on Facebook and YouTube and sometimes other platforms yep. from one device, um, it also is what we used for your webinar earlier this week and other webinars is, we've yeah. done. So it's, um, it's a big piece and it plays a major role in it. So we wanted to kind of go top to bottom about webinars. And since you just went through this. <laughs> well, let's talk about some of the key differences here. Because um, even I, in the beginning, was having issues, you know, discerning between the two. There's a pretty significant difference between what you would see for a live stream and a webinar. One of them is a lot more mm -hmm. formal than the other. So, you know, we're doing this. It's very straight to the point. We're, we're cutting across all of the topics that we need to cover. Where a webinar might be like, all right, guys, you know, nice to see you. We're going to give it a few more minutes before we get started. Um, just give me a second while I switch over to this. It's a little bit more informal, a little bit yeah. more um, kind of like almost like a workshop you'd have in the room with other people. I mean, that's the idea. The interesting part is webinar is a very generic term, right? It's yes. basically you're going to something on the web to learn about something as a, in a virtual classroom-ish environment. But there are multiple ways to do a webinar. And some people choose to do it through, let's say, teleconferencing, web conferencing style applications right. like WebEx or Zoom or some of those platforms. You can use something smaller um, scale like a peer in if you've just got like a yeah, conference type exactly. room you wanted to utilize. Those have their pros, they also have their cons. We have chosen when we do our webinars to do them very much in the same way we do this live show right. where we do a live stream typically to YouTube um, and, and run it that way. Now. Why we choose that, there's a number of reasons. Again, there's pros and cons to it. Um, I think one of the main reasons we do it, one, we get to use our own products yes, for that uh, nice. with the Pearl. But I find it allows us to bring in more variation of content because we can bring in any type of video signal from basically anything we want. Right. So as it gives us more flexibility. Right. right, as long as we're meeting the, the key information that YouTube exactly. requires, so, you know, bitrate and coding settings. Yeah, that's that's that stuff's easy. Yeah. But if you're using those, you know, more web conferencing style tools, you typically get a webcam and you get a desktop share of the computer that's participating. That's usually about it. Well, and we can also talk about the fact limiting. a lot of the times, too, you're not even getting 30 frames per second for that yeah, either. Not on you're desktop shares. No, so. you're, you're, you're showing a screen, it's maybe 10, 15 frames per second, so there's a lot of jitter, and sometimes there's a complete break in the video signal. So if you're trying to show a video content, basically anything other than a PowerPoint or a slide deck presentation, mm -hmm. you're going to run into issues. So I think doing it through a live stream gives you more flexibility. Um, the other thing that uh, that you can do is is like I say bring in different subject matter, um, but it, I I just like it that way. Maybe it's because I'm just more used to it. But we wanted to go through the different steps that we have here. And Stefan was just saying, you know, will we cover how a solo presenter can record a webinar by themselves, uh, or maybe also stream it with something like Webcaster Pearl? Yeah, exactly. That's actually part of our <laughs> our yep. list as one recommended way you might want to do things and how easy that can be when you're doing it in, in a live stream style uh, format. But let's start off the top when you come up with the grand idea, foolish or not, that you're going to do a webinar. What do you do? Well, you got to start with planning. Yes. And I mean, if without a plan, you're not set up for success, you're going to run into a lot of questions. You may get uh, brain fog like we had at the very beginning before we got YouTube up and running. Yeah. Um, you may run into issues where suddenly you go, I lost my train of thought. I'm missing something. Yeah. What, what next? So there's a lot of pre-planning that goes into it. Planning, obviously, the subject of the webinar, the general outline of, of what you want to talk about, bullet point talking points, kind of like we're reading from right now on yep. this sheet for this show because there's a lot there. Um, the biggest thing is estimating the amount of time it's going to take for that particular subject. And this is important because when you start advertising a webinar, 
People want to know how much time they have to dedicate to sit right. there. Often these happen in the middle of the business day. How much time they're going to sit there to consume this content. Most people can't do a three hour webinar in the middle of the work day. So they need to know how much time they're going to have to dedicate to it. So making sure you have an outline to estimate it and then putting that into your advertising as part of your plan to say this is going to be a one hour or a two hour webinar. That, that's an important piece of the puzzle. Yeah, and if it, if it goes a little bit under, a little bit over, then you know that's that can be forgivable. But sometimes you may not have any ideas until you do your first webinar. Exactly. The other thing that we've run into, and both you and I have now experienced this done a couple of these webinars, is rehearsal. Rehearsal is important to a point. It can also be very detrimental. <laughs> it can be. Over-rehearsing can actually hurt you. Uh, and the same goes for this live show. When we first started doing this live show 96 episodes ago, we used to fully script rehearse front to back. Yep. The problem was, is probably less than 10 episodes and maybe less than five episodes in, five. we started running into the situation where we would blow through all of our great off-the-cuff material in rehearsal, and then when we were actually live, uh, nothing, nothing to say. Nothing, yeah. <laughs> and you, the same thing can happen in a webinar. Yeah, of course. You, you forget that this banter didn't actually happen, the audience wasn't there, and so it just it disappears completely. Yeah. So if you want it to be a little more dynamic, you want it to be... Um, just a little more interesting and not super heavily scripted, you want to rehearse only the broader outline. You don't right. want to go and try to rehearse every single detail, little detailed piece of the script. Now, as Stefan said, if you were recording it by yourself, not live streaming it, you're just recording it That's to post different. later, then you're probably going to want to be heavily scripted, but you also have the option of editing. Yes. So you can heavily script it, and if you blow a take, you redo it, it's not a big deal. You'll edit it later in post. So there are ways that, that super rehearsal could be good. But if it's live, live, I would say rehearse it to a point. Know what you're talking about and rehearse maybe the broader timing, but then cut yourself off. Yeah, I would say the biggest thing is uh, you may not need to, to do the meat and potatoes, so the, the, the script of itself, but the technical rehearsal is hugely important, right? To understand that if you're doing a larger production, you're not the only person in the room. Let's say you've got a producer that's running the show that's able to switch between the specific layouts and do all these things like Cameron over here is for us. We need to make sure that everyone's on the same page, so if uh, they can try and anticipate what the, the host wants to do. So if I was to say, hey, so uh, I'm going to show you guys something very quickly on the laptop, then Cameron has the ability to go into that specific layout and make that change on the fly. Yeah. And then we're not scrambling waiting for 10, 15 seconds going, at any minute now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I find well, the, and the, Sorry, the UI that we have uh, available through us, um, sorry, through our web portal, makes it very easy to switch between those layouts. Yeah. And the right amount of rehearsal will get you into the right flow, know what you're looking for, and not scrambling to, to get yeah, into it. Exactly, exactly. yeah, that, that definitely helps. Having everyone on the same page for anything always helps, of course. Yeah. Um, you had guests on this most recent one. Yes. That adds a whole other challenge of making sure people are on the same page, knowing when to bring them in. Now, in our case, we brought them in over Skype, and we we're going to talk about that setup uh, a little bit here. Um, but that adds a whole other level of difficulty. And I think what you mentioned earlier this week in our debrief for it was, again, tying back to rehearsal. That's we where did. things kind of went a little sideways. We did, yeah, we did. So, so I might guess, if, for those of you that were privy to, to see this webinar, which will eventually be posted to our, uh, our YouTube page and our accounts and such, You'll notice that the interview is very straight to the point. All of the the questions that we had, which were about five five or six different questions, were essentially just hammered through. And an interview right. that we had anticipated estimating around 30 minutes ended up being closer to 10 to 15. Yeah, and that's a problem. Because then it throws off all of your timing for the entire webinar, and you're left kind of holding the bag as the host going, OK, now what? Um, so yeah, it, it there's a lot of things. And I think, again, that's where maybe saying, hey, we're going to bring you in for this amount, this is the subject, but not right. actually go through all those questions. Uh, and I've been now a guest on a couple of podcasts and other shows in the past uh, month or so, and I have to say that some of those rehearsed, some of those didn't. Yeah. I actually kind of prefer the ones where we didn't really do the rehearsal. I just, mm -hmm. I would rather take the questions on the fly and just go through them as they come. Um, I think it plays in, Stefan was mentioning here, being spontaneously live makes you more real and believable. 
Exactly. Um, that it adds a different level to it. It makes it uh, scripting is yeah. It's good. Mm. If you <laughs> if you're really good with scripts and you can make it look natural, then you're golden, right? We, I can use um, the the Grand Tour hosts as a prime example. For those of you that used to watch the Top Gear with the older hosts, Jeremy Clarkson, Richard Hammond, and uh, James May, three of them have a heavily scripted show, but they make it look so natural and off yeah. the cuff. Well, they've been doing it for long enough, but yeah, that's a, that's a different thing there. It's a talent. Um, Stefan was also saying, do you see a presentation as an event, like a speaker and a presentation as a webinar, or is it something else? I, honestly, I think we shouldn't obsess over the term webinar because to me that's really a piece of educational content you're consuming on the web is all yep. that means to me. Um, so yes, if someone is a speaker and giving a presentation, if you're live streaming it, to me that's, you could call that a webinar. Whether you want to advertise it that way is up to you, but I think you could legitimately say that uh, that it is. Generally, I think what more broadly says what a webinar is, is if it's pre-scheduled, there's a sign-up for it. It's yep. not just random ad hoc stumble across it. It's intentional signing up so that people know ahead of time how many people are going to be there live, in person, or whatever. Um, so there's usually an extra layer of, of scheduling, advertising, sign-ups, those sorts of things. Right, uh, and, and it all becomes if you're, you know, if it's a service or a product and what you want to talk yeah. about it. So I, I, I try to look at it as some sort of a workshop, right? Whether it's just amongst friends, amongst colleagues, you say, hey, on this day and this time, I'm going to be showcasing or showing or teaching this. Why don't you guys come by and check it out? And then I can go, hey, guys, thanks for coming. Here's what I have for you today. Then you do your little speech. You ask, you know, you ask questions, they, they provide answers, and they ask questions, and you provide answers, and then you guys all go home happy, hopefully. But that also ties into to our next segment, right? Yeah. When we're talking about everything is planned, and so we run into and marketing. marketing. <laughs> yeah, marketing. So pre-scheduling it, right. um, emailing a list of people. You know, if you have a, a customer list that you believe who is going to be interested in the subject matter, maybe blast out a newsletter to them yep. uh, saying you're hosting it. You want to do that well in advance and remind them a certain window of time as well because a month in advance is a good time to let people know what's happening yep. and they might say yes, but then they totally forget about it. So you want to remind them. Like two weeks you know, out, usually a yeah, few days out. And I know people hate getting spammed with this stuff, but no one would show up to webinars if you didn't remind them because everyone forgets. And it, you told them the last minute, they just wouldn't show up at all because they're like, well, I already have something else booked. I mean, an argument so. could also be made that you're not really spamming those people at that point because they showed an interest, they wanted yeah. to be going or watching this specific webinar, and so they need to be or perhaps want to be reminded that, oh, yeah, right, I right. wanted to do this. I think the other advantage coming back to doing it in a live stream format versus a, a web conference format is that we can even embed that live stream on our website. Now, there's a reason we might want to do that. One, you can easily create a paywall on your own website to, to make sure people have to get through that. Yep. Whether it's just registration for a free paywall to, to collect the people's information. And let's be honest, when you're running a business, people's information is, is cash money, right? So you want to know who's there with their email address because you're going to want to hit them later. Um, that sounds like one of those weird dirty tricks, but it's a reality of internet marketing. We're all doing it day in and day out, and that's just the world we live in online. Yep. Um, but when you're giving out this content, you want to make sure that you're capturing that information so that you can use it later um, for, for various different uh, marketing purposes um, within the bounds of the law that, <laughs> that there are in many places, of course. Right. Um, so being able to do that on your website gives you a whole bunch of different options, and, and a live stream is much more conducive to that. Right, and there's there's other things that you can do too to try and get people's attention as well. Um, Facebook is really good for this, right? If you have a friend or a company that you're following suddenly start a live stream, as an example, they usually throws a little pop up in the bottom right hand corner or in the top right hand corner, depending on if you're on uh, a mobile device or on a desktop platform. Uh, the same can be said, right? If you set up, you know, a specific webinar that you want to have embedded on your specific page, you can have it so that it throws a pop-up saying, hey, I know you're looking at this product, but check out what we have going on right now. Yeah. You might really be interested. Exactly. I uh, see so a lot of chat in here, and I know, Cameron, I think you already mentioned that in, uh, in the comments there, that uh, people were 
noticing something was a little different about the camera shot. I wasn't aware of that looking at this, but uh, <laughs> I guess earlier in the day, uh, now, now it all makes sense to me. Oh, earlier right. in the day, we had changed the output on our Canon C100, our main camera, to an interlaced mode for a test. Um, Sorry. And everyone's complaining about the quality. Well, see here. <laughs> well, and uh, thank you to Faithfulness, as she pointed out, the audio was good. Of course. And if you don't have good audio. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> my, my rule of uh, thumb is you have a choice between upgrading video or audio, audio comes first. But that's that's a personal thing, I'm an audio guy. But this brings up one of my biggest pet peeves that a, a little bit of a sidetrack to bring it up. Interlaced signals live streaming on the internet suck. Don't yep. do it. Use progressive signals. Compressing interlace sucks. Stop it. Anyway. You usually uh, you usually get banding and yeah. li so lines and things you don't Well, and that's why do. we did it on this week's episode, to show you how not <laughs> yeah. to do it. Yeah, nice. So, nice obviously, save, nice we save. did this intentionally, so uh, I am do as we say, not as we do. <laughs> I, I am 100% at fault for this uh, this video quality thing. I had to run a test earlier and change a few yeah. things. So, so I, we will sorry. fix that later. Last minute changes to the studio, as always, threw a wrench in the gears. We're back to the subject at hand, after my ranting there. Um, so... The other thing that we try to do is obviously apply lessons we've learned from previous webinars, try and improve things over time, um, you know, bringing in um, different types of things, how we run, like when we bring in a guest over Skype, yep. how we route that through uh, all our different pieces. We change that every now and then to bring the quality up as best we can. Um, and then, you know, kind of a little bit of what we're doing today, communicating off camera or off main camera where, yep. you know, camera's kind of playing side producer guy, um, you know, stuff like that helps. Having a co-host helps. Uh, honestly, it's, it's, <laughs> it's the best thing ever. Uh, I learned that very, very, uh, it was a hard lesson for me for this webinar that, that just passed that, yeah. uh, you know, if, if things don't run according to your estimate, uh, your estimated time or your plan, and then you're left trying to juggle too many things yeah. simultaneously as one person. Having a co-host certainly helps with banter, being able to keeps evenly, the flow. It, it distributes the content so much better. Yeah. It keeps the flow, and if you suddenly find yourself stuck, you have one of those brain farts that ever happens now and then, right? You just right. get stuck. Having a co-host means that they can pick up, carry that ball for a little while until you kind of snap out of it. Right, back to, <laughs> back to our thing. Yeah. Um, so that's always a great thing to have. Now, you can definitely do it by yourself. Um, you know, coming back again to what Stefan said earlier, I would say if you are trying to do it solo, you might want to do it recorded and not live because you could cut out dead air and things like that in your right. post. Whereas doing it solo live, if you suddenly just freeze up or forget something and have dead air, that's not good. You don't want that. And you, you, there's no way to save it. Um, whereas with a recording, you could save it before you post it. Now, that being uh, said, so. if you're determined, you're absolutely saying, I'm solo and I'm going to do a live webinar, the best thing we can say is run through your setup 100,000 times. Figure out the, the simplest, most optimized solution for everything you want to do, even if it's just this little device that has six buttons on it and helps yeah. you switch between your layouts, um, or it's going to trigger audio or music or something in the background. Keep it simple. It's yeah. going to be the best way of being able to get across everything. The nice thing with something like Pearl Mini uh, is that it has that touch screen on the front. I love that thing. So if you were doing your own webinar as a solo person, you could have a Pearl Mini in front of you running all your audio and video stuff directly into it. And you could do all of your start, stop, and switching and confidence monitoring just from that touch screen straight in front of you. And it would actually help a lot. So one of the things we also kind of mentioned a bit already is that if you do have a third party do a running producer for you, yep. if they don't know the content that well, then they might not switch when you want them to switch, or there might be a delay as you say, hey, Cameron, can you bring up the thing, you know? The do thing, I wanted the thing. It yeah, might take that thing, that thing. thing. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so if, if they're in tune with the script, it's, it's not so bad. But if you could do it yourself, it means that you know it's going to switch when you want it to switch. Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't also still have the co-host to right. help out and everything. So, so one of the things you know, we're talking about, you know, learning from your mistakes and learning from your, your past experiences is one of the challenges that, that you know, we were able to resolve in this last webinar that we had a challenge discovered for the <laughs> webinar before that was being able to get audio for the producers to hear all of the content. So in this yeah. case, we had our, our Skype interviews. Now, uh, we do have a little a graph and, and yeah, such we'll that Cameron went over that as well. Start looking at our wiring diagram, uh, which is a it, challenging it's, one. It's challenging, yet simple, yet yeah. get, 
That'll be one thing. But and we did have questions about bringing Skype into a Perl. Well, perfect. So how we do this is um, I'm complicated spaghetti wiring, uh, <laughs> but no, it's actually not that bad. So what we've um, what we've got is a diagram of our main setup. So this is the usual setup that we go through every week. We have our Perl 2, which is the workhorse of this uh, this whole setup. We have all of the inputs. We're usually maxing them out and even bringing in other inputs from other sources. Uh, even this week, we have uh, one of our inputs is coming in via a USB converter into one of the USB ports. That's not um, shown on this setup today. But uh, as you can see on this diagram, we have our Perl 2. Coming into that, we have our audio mixer, which is bringing in our host audio, as well as um, uh, excuse me, we have our confidence monitors coming out. We often have a host laptop. And for the webinar this week, we had another camera because we wanted to show what was going on on the, f on the face of the Pearl Mini. So we had that Sony uh, a7 II just sitting directed right, right at the... Right uh, pointing at a... Exactly, screen. right at the Pearl Mini. Now, um, we had a previous uh, live episode where we had a Skype guest. One of the challenges with that Skype guest is that our hosts were able to hear the audio but the producer wasn't able to hear the audio from the Skype guest just because of the way we had it configured. It was a new setup. And you lose and cues that way. Yeah, exactly. You lose cues. And yeah. I was, I remember just feeling sick because I couldn't hear anything. <laughs> George and George were just nodding away, no, yeah, right? Yeah, and no problem. I wasn't sure, like, are you hearing anything? <laughs> Do I need to panic? Yeah. And then they started talking back and forth. And then, you know, about... I think it was like 15 or 20 seconds later, the delay from the YouTube finally yep. caught up, and then I could hear our guest. I thought, oh, good. <laughs> yeah, it's a little <laughs> actually, bit of a panic if you can't monitor it, like, yeah, for yeah. sure. But um, let me show you how uh, we did our Skype this week. So the way we did our Skype this week was we brought in a HDMI out from the Pearl, and that HDMI out was on our secondary HDMI out port, yep. and that brought over just the Canon C100 feed. With the Pearl series, we can actually tell the HDMI outputs which signal to bring out. We can bring out the channels, we can bring out specific video sources, and for that one what we did was we brought out the specific video source that also carried over the audio as well, because we wanted to use that mic audio from our studio, which is that overhead boom mic. Yeah. That went into our MacBook Pro and HDMI out from the MacBook Pro just on a crop on the full screen with our Skype feed was then fed back, back into, into the Pearl. Pearl. Now, one of the other challenges, obviously, is we're doing a Skype call. We have the laptop all the way over here and the hoster at the table. So to solve that problem, we had an audio splitter and one of those lines from the audio splitter went to a wireless lav relay. So it was a Rode, um, the, filmmaker, the filmmaker lav. I think that's the right model number or model name, but that one was going directly to um, directly to Matt at the desk, so he could hear it. And then we also had that line coming out into the mixer, so that we were mixing that with both of our channels, so there was no latency between Skype and our local host. And then we also had a monitor off of that that the producer was listening to, so that we could actually know that we had clean audio from that. Yeah. So a little bit of um, I wouldn't say it's like a. Uh, cobbled setup, but it was a yeah, setup that we had, is. and it's, we, yeah, it yeah, kind of is. And but, honestly, uh, the way it's you, all the equipment that we have in house, yeah, right? So yes. the way you say it here. actually makes it sound far more complicated than it actually is yes. when you see it logically laid out physically in front of you. Totally. You're like, yeah, that's obvious. This goes here, and this goes here, and yeah, and but that's it. It, it can be that easy, um, and that really gives you the advantage. The other thing is that one of the best parts, I think, is that we're saying we're bringing in a guest from Skype, yeah. but this setup, we could have used any conferencing tool on that MacBook Pro. It could have been Skype, could have been a peer in, could have been WebEx. WebEx or Zoom or anything else, and it would have worked exactly the same way. Right. It doesn't rely specifically on Skype when you do it this way. There are other tools out there that have direct plugins for Skype, Skype TX appliances and stuff like that. But that's Skype only, what about, so it's uh, somewhat limiting. What about Google Hangout? Yeah, that would work too. Right. I mean, it wouldn't matter, right? Like anything would work. Well, it's anything it that has a display FaceTime. on the screen. Yeah, right? it could be FaceTime. It doesn't matter. Well, right? you, you mentioned FaceTime, and if anyone watching the show caught an episode that we did a few weeks ago with Adobe Character Animator, I did some testing before the episode just to see how it would work, you know, kind of figure it out in advance. And what I did was I created a loop back within the within my MacBook Pro itself. So outputting an HDMI source from Adobe Character Animator that had the character's face, and then I inputted that back in using the AVIO, and then that was the camera source within FaceTime. 
So I was actually able to call my kids as a unicorn, did some goofy voices. It was pretty fun. My daughter, she's only uh, three. She was terrified. She didn't <laughs> understand why this like unicorn had her dad's voice, but my uh, older son thought it was great. So there's a lot of really cool applications. And like George said, anything that's displaying a video on your laptop, you can just grab that and yeah, feed it right exactly. back in. And that, that's, again, the big part of using Perl as a cornerstone for this, because whatever it is that's coming in over HDMI, it doesn't matter whether it's a MacBook or something else. As long as we're getting an HDMI feed, we can crop it, we can chroma key it if we want. That's we fun. can play around with it to, to really bring in anything into that mix, and so right. that's great. So yeah. I wanted to touch on a couple questions yeah, here because they're coming in, and then we're going to look at uh, some other things uh, on our list here. Um, so let's see. Well, Faithful Mess was just saying Epifan has changed the live streaming game for you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, we're trying, um, and we learn as much as you do as we stumble through this wonderful world of live streaming. So thank you very much. Uh, that's the highest compliment from my, my side. Faithfulness, um, enter in the contest so we can yeah. meet you in person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, enter the go. contest, <laughs> win a trip, NAB. Um, anyways, Stefan was also saying, is there an app to control Webcaster or Perl remotely or kind of button board or something like that? Webcaster, no. Perl, yes. Um, so Perl, there's a few ways of doing it. It has its own web browser-based UIs that you can use remotely, which means you could do it from a smartphone, a tablet, a laptop, a desktop, anything with a web browser. Yep. You could also do it um, very soon to be released from a Crestron control panel. So oh, if you have yes. a much more sophisticated setup where you have a Crestron controller controlling a whole bunch of other stuff, maybe your lighting and audio, a whole bunch, you'll be able to integrate that control. You've always been able to, but it's about to get a whole lot easier. Um, you'll be able to integrate that control into a Crestron touch panel to control a Perl function as well. We'll yeah. actually be showing that in our booth at ISE. So. Um, and then there is another one as well. There's a company called Scarhoy. Uh, they oh, make yeah, a whole bunch of different um, broadcast style controllers. Right. Um, they have integrated uh, our HTTP control API into some of their controllers as well. Hmm. And so you can customize the buttons to do whatever you want on a Perl. So it could be the switching, it could be whatever. Right. Um, so there are definitely ways to do it. Uh, we've shown it on the show before, but uh, our colleague Adam also made his oh, own yes. little button board that connects over Wi-Fi that leverages our API, and he custom built that, and, and it's super cool. The 3D um, printed and everything. Yeah, and so there's lots of ways you can play uh, with that stuff if you want. So if you guys are looking for that, the list of commands and such, you can find it at the back of the yeah. user guide, or if you're using the online user guide for Perl Mini or Perl 2, you can just search it, RS-232 or HTTP API. Yeah. Um, someone was also asking, um, Dave, I think, responded to it. Someone else also asking about bringing in another um, capture card, USB capture card into Webcaster. Uh, yes, it is possible. Um, as Dave mentioned, it is only a USB 2 port, so uncompressed capture cards are not going to give you the best frame rates. Um, but if it's a UVC compliant, like a webcam, uh, USB capture card, it will work. Our own AVIO HD does work. Um, it's not going to be the highest frame rate because USB mm -hmm. 2 really brings that down. Uh, go back and see our episode of a USB bandwidth <laughs> from a couple weeks ago if you want to hear all the rantings about 2 versus 3. Um, but essentially, anything that's UVC compliant, like webcams and, and quite a number of USB capture cards, including yep. our own AVIO line, will work. Um, but if you're doing that, I would say you want your that to be your secondary input with your less important frame rate stuff. Yeah, so your PowerPoint, PowerPoint, you still want HDMI for your camera to get the full frame rates. But anyway, um, let's see. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of just general chatter in here. Uh, actually, Stefan, there's this thing here. What about Stream Deck? Uh, it's programmable. Yes, but it requires custom software to do that programming for the Stream Deck. And uh, I've been thinking about ways we might be able to overcome that because the Stream Deck, the Stream Deck Mini and the full Stream Deck, they're pretty cool, um, but they do require that Elgato software for programming and, and mm. interpolation of, of what the key mappings are. Um, so obviously that doesn't exist in, in Webcaster or, or Perl. So no, but I think it would be cool to figure out a way to make it work. But that's not leaking anything. That's just my own dreams, I think, of in the shower in the morning on the way to work. Wouldn't yep. a stream deck be... Anyway. <laughs> Weird dreams. I do. I think about work nonstop. Um, so would a Logic PTZ camera work with the webcaster? 
Uh, USB camera, yeah, it should. If it's UVC compliant, absolutely. Uh, there should be no reason it wouldn't. If it requires, basically, if it requires drivers, it, it won't work. Right. I think that's all on the uh, questions for now. But please throw more in there if you feel like it. Um, so another thing we wanted to touch on. Um, Can we talk about money? Yeah, that kind of, yeah, that, that plays into that next one. All right. What does it cost to run webinars? Well, you can do it cheap, you can do it expensive, you can do it somewhere in between. If you don't do it that often, you might even want to consider renting some of the gear to save your capital costs. Yeah. Um, you know, certainly if you're going for a larger setup, let's say the way we do it with a Pearl 2 and all these pieces, yeah, that's no, that's no small penny but you know you're going to have a stable thing that's going to work all the time, so yeah. it's probably worth it. I would say if you're doing one webinar a month, buying is probably well worth the money. If you're doing one webinar every six months, Brett. yeah, you might not need to own everything. No, yeah, um, and, and to be fair, you know, we're also talking about the, the, the quality of the gear and the cost of the gear as well, right? If, if what you're looking to invest in, even if you're only doing it two or three times a year, is only going to cost you as total, you know, five, six hundred dollars, then it would, maybe it'll mm -hmm. be worth it buying it. But if we're talking into the thousands of dollars, you're, you're looking at a mixing board, a, yeah. a Pearl 2 or well, a Pearl Mini. And that's one of the microphones. Is that audio gear is generally pretty cheap it's to rent. It's very cheap to rent. So you don't necessarily have to own a super big mixer when you could rent one every six months for peanuts. You know, it's like, true. and microphones are always super cheap. So that you could be a little more dynamic on. I would say your video gear, because that can be maybe a little touchier that you want to know a little better to yeah. a degree, uh, you might want to own more of that stuff. But audio gear is inexpensive. I mean, cameras are still pretty expensive to rent. Like, Yes, they can be. You could rent a camera twice and it would pay for buying it in a lot of cases. So to me, I think renting audio gear is worth it because it's cheap. But video gear starts to get pricey and you kind of have to look at that cost benefit analysis to see there's How a lot of overlap too, so yeah. depending on what kind of work you're doing, if you're doing video production work, you have a lot of the gear to get you set up to do a webinar, and um, yeah, it just depends on what level of quality. So if you want to get a small DSLR or something that's a quick point and shoot, there's even some great options, obviously from Panasonic, really stable imagery and uh, great cameras, don't cost a lot of money, and then again, you're not paying it, you know, paying for it forever, for yeah. like a rental. Yeah. Now, if, the, if some of you guys are interested in knowing exactly how much it costs to rent audio gear, as a prime example, the, the Rode NTG4 microphone that we have up here is about seven $800, probably Canadian, maybe a little yeah. bit less than you. So five American. bucks American. But it's about, I think it's six or seven dollars to rent for like three or four days. So, yeah, I mean, you true. have time to, to rent it, test it, use it. Return it. Do a bunch of recording, yeah. then return it. And it costs you like ten bucks. Whoop de doo. <laughs> if you if you get the added insurance, maybe an extra two, three dollars yeah, on that. Yeah. So it, it's it's definitely worth it if you're yeah. just going to do it a couple times a year. Yeah. Uh, but obviously that's going to vary depending, again, on frequency, right? If, if it's something that you do webinars once a month, it's definitely worth the investment to just buy gear that you're going to know inside and out so that you have the most flawless performance you possibly can. Uh, because every time you change something, <laughs> it throws a wrench. And yep. so you want to you wanna know your stuff. And it's also important to understand that if you're going to be doing this at a more constant basis, you don't have to have everything in one shot. If you can only afford to get one thing at a time, that's perfectly fine too. Your audience will grow with you as your show continues hopefully. to evolve. If your content's good, hopefully it will. Fair point. <laughs> um, but I think overall, um, you know, webinar-wise, Content is number one, because no one's going to watch if it's a subject they don't care about. It's true. Titling it for advertising, so you get that sweet, sweet SEO. That's important, um, super important. And we've done shows talking about SEO, if you want to learn more about that. Um, having stable gear and how you want to run it, uh, knowing it inside and out, making sure everyone's on the same page. Sorry, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, rehearsing, but not over-rehearsing. I do that too much. Um, yeah, I mean, that's... And learn, That's learn from it. Out. That's the TLDR. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely learn from from those experiences, right? If you've done a webinar and you thought it was perfect and you have nothing to learn from it, chances are you do. You just haven't looked hard enough. Exactly. And that's totally fine, right? You, everyone starts somewhere, and eventually you'll figure out how to refine and perfect that every time. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, 
Yeah, I'm just looking at some of these uh, comments and questions in here. Definitely, if you guys have any questions about webinar stuff in general, uh, throw it in there. There's a lot of uh, just chatter here about uh, USB cameras on Webcaster and stuff like that. And, and if you have um, makes and models you're curious about, uh, post them in our forums, uh, in our community forums, and uh, we'll. Uh, can't promise that we can buy one to test one, but we'll we'll do our best. We'll certainly look over specs, yeah. see what makes sense. Um, you know, try to see it. And if it's something it is easy to get our hands on, you know, we can we can always try to do that. Um, now, if you, you don't know, know where our community, you can always are. check out that uh, webcaster forum on Facebook exactly. too. Exactly. Yeah. So it's not an official Epifan forum, but it's a forum that's just put together yeah. by a community of users. And there's a lot of people on there. They're using different equipment, and they may have already tried that. And you can learn from them. Yeah. That that webcaster X2 group is is pretty good. Um, so if you what was that guy doing that other day? He was live streaming some wiring. He was playing around. Oh with. yeah. He was yeah. trying to like. Uh, oh, he was using the new Roland uh, VO2. Yeah, and he was trying mm -hmm. to, yeah, to yeah. be able to put it into some oh, sort of portable battery pack and. Yeah. Of the he beat me to so. it. I wanted to test that thing. <laughs> oh well, I guess there's a show canceled. No. Well, he, he also did a previous episode where he put a mount on the bottom yes. of the webcaster. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, he's just he's hacking our uh, hacking our stuff I apart. Think, he's I think doing a great cool. job. Now, if you don't know where the community forums are, we'll start by going to epifan.com. Uh, from there, you'll be able to find it in the top right hand corner. But the first thing you're going to see, obviously, is that uh, contest, especially for the hundredth episode. So if you haven't submitted a video, you know some fun editing, cool shoots and angles and such and some interesting content and reasons why you should be the person who's cho who selected for this, we urge you to please, please submit. We'd love to see the content. And it's an amazing contest. We're going to be putting you up at either um, at either one of these shows, uh, covering accommodation, like airfare. Six and, <laughs> and all we're looking for is just a, a quick video. It doesn't have to be complicated. You could produce uh, the heck out of it, or you could keep it as simple as just a webcam or your iPhone. And just tell us why going to one of these events will change your life and take you up to the next level of your uh, live streaming and just the production work that you do. What, when you get to experience alone and just the tech that you're going to oh, see, the different much. companies and the, the brains you get to pick, it's mind blowing. So there were a couple of things in here that I wanted to quickly address. Uh, Maris was just saying, is it possible to share sources between two separate Perl 2 units, uh, like an SDI feed, um, sure. or maybe only streaming from one Perl 2 to another? Yes, uh, you could. There's a number of ways of doing that. Um, you could use an SDI in on one Perl 2 and an HDMI out from that one to the next one as a physical wired loop. You could actually stream between them if they're on the same local network using RTSP streaming. Yep. Um, so there's a way of doing that as well. Um, so there's a few different methods to do that. Um, but uh, if you want to send us an email about what use case you have in mind, because I'm kind of curious, send it to us just at info at epifan.com and uh, we'd be happy to discuss that with you in more detail. Uh, and then Ghost was just saying, I'm um, sorry, not a webinar related, but any future integration for custom alert overlays, let's say Streamlabs and so on, uh, into something like a Perl 2 um, as a firmware update. No immediate short-term plans for that. Um, what some people do today is they'll use one of the HDMI inputs coming from a computer that might gather those alerts mm -hmm. um, and use chroma keying to add them as overlays that way. Um, just key out the background coming from that computer, basically. Um, so some people do that today, um, whether it's for titling or for alerts or anything like that. It's not the easiest method to do it. Again, you know, street, the way Streamlabs does it, they have this whole back-end API system. It's, it's pretty complicated what they offer that has to plug into all your different resources right, within yeah. their version of OBS to your Twitch account, for example, and all these other pieces. Um, so although it would be interesting, that would require a significant amount of work to put into something like uh, the Pearl. So uh, not to say it would never happen, but we don't really have a short-term plan to do that at the moment. Um, and again, if it wasn't Streamlabs, what else would it be? Who knows? Six people will give six answers. So, <laughs> I mean, we'd love to hear the answers. It helps would, us learn. Would. Uh, but the easiest way is to you just use video signals whenever possible, uh, and then you, then you know it's good. Yeah. So any other questions, throw them in chat. But I think that covers it for today. Um, hosting a webinar is not easy. No. Nope. Um, and yeah, I hope some of the tips we've shared with you today will help you be successful in uh, the next webinar you attempt. Um, but yeah, we'll, uh, we'll definitely do more in the future, and we'll let everyone know when we do have those coming up. Um, I think we did have some ideas for some of the next few months. I don't remember what they are, because I don't 
remember what next week's episode is. We're uh, next week. Well, I know next week's live show. We're talking about uh, streamingchurch.tv. Yes. Ah. Yes. Great. Thank you. I remember now. Uh, yes. Next week's episode, uh, live at Epifan, we will have guests from streamingchurch.tv, one of our partners who's recently integrated uh, the Webcaster X2 into their streaming platform, and uh, so we're super excited to talk to those guys and share their knowledge of why you might want to live stream uh, church services and uh, and how important that is in this day and age uh, for that market. I believe so. it's Phil that's going to be hosting that next week. It's usually Steve and Phil. Yeah, involved. we're going to be talking to Steve and Phil. Yeah, the great and guys. Um, <laughs> next week it's going to be a new configuration for Skype because we're going to be doing a, a three-way call on Skype. Phil and Steve work in the same city, but they don't work in the same office. Mm. So we're going to be toggling back and forth between those two channels. So another uh, another new experiment on Epifan Live and... Um, yeah, something else to figure out. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to know how many layouts are going to be for, for that live show specifically. Tune in Minimal. next week and you can see. <laughs> Tune in for next week. Feel free to ask on my behalf. <laughs> um, Stefan, I'm, I'm not even sure what that product is, so I'm going to have to look that up. Roadcaster Pro, no idea. Look it up. But um, again, it's obviously audio. It's road, you know, injected into HDMI. Yes, there are HDMI audio injectors. That would yep. definitely work to bring in any analog audio injected to embedded HDMI. That would definitely work. Uh, we've talked about that in episodes way gone by, but Monoprice uh, Mono has some cheap ones yes. um, that are pretty easy. Um, it was the Blackbird HDMI audio yeah, insert. Yeah, um, but if a USB audio device is UAC compliant, the audio version of UVC, Yes, it will work over USB into a webcaster. So yep. we've used things like the Blue Yeti, um, some just basic wired lav mics over USB. Uh, lots of people have used that little Sabarant uh, 3.5 yep. mil USB uh, adapter uh, that you can get for like seven bucks. Um, so there are lots of ways. cheaper than that. Yeah. Anyways, there's, uh, our community forums has a section under the webcaster. It's called Accessories uh, Recommended for Webcaster. We have our list at the top of that page, yeah. but there's so many other comments underneath from other users that have try tested, tried, and successfully utilized other UAC okay. and UVC devices. Yeah, okay, Stephen. It's a mixer for podcasting. I'll have to check that out. I, I suspect it is. Um, Martin, does everyone at Epifan have a beard? Not yet. <laughs> Yet. It's, Some of this Soon. is also a winter thing. Soon. It is winter here in Canada. The weather, weather this week has been crazy. We got and about that much snow yesterday. Uh, no, maybe literally, literally that much. Anyway, snow this like keeps that. you warm. Yeah, yeah it helps. <laughs> um, Stefan, to your thing, Mixer for Podcast, I'm also interested in this new Roland thing I shared with you guys. The oh, yeah, yeah, very cool. It has a USB out. I want to know what happens with that. I have seen, I've seen one customer utilizing a Behringer mixer with a USB out with yeah. the webcaster successfully. Okay. Um, Again, is it UAC or does it require drivers? That's the, that's the question. That's the question. So, anyway, that's going to do it for us uh, this week. Thanks for my, very much for joining us. Join us next week for Streaming Church. And uh, hopefully see you in Amsterdam if you're so lucky to go to ISE. Enter the contest. Like, subscribe, comment, all those things, socially stuff. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.